Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you to everyone who's tuning in and who's staying with us through these uh, strange and difficult times. Uh, thank you to First Fridays, which continues to support Winnipeg's artistic community, and to Karen Schultz, who does so much behind the scenes. Uh, thank you to our funders, uh, the Winnipeg Arts Council, the Manitoba Arts Council, and the Free Press, uh, who supports us. Thank you to Collective Broadcast Co. and Aaron Zegers, who's helping us with tech tonight. And a reminder, even if we're not in the Exchange District tonight on a beautiful spring night, um, as we were in the old days, uh, the Exchange District is still there uh, with galleries, with artists, arts organizations, independent stores and restaurants. So please check out the First Friday's website to see, uh, keep up what's happening, keep up with what's happening and, and try to support some of those folks. And finally, thank you so much to our guest tonight, artist, activist, occasional agony aunt, Bev Pike. Um, since graduating from the Alberta College of Art in Calgary, Winnipeg-based painter Bev Pike has exhibited in solo and group exhibitions across Canada. She's received seniors, senior arts grants from the Winnipeg Arts Council, the Manitoba Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, her work is in the collections of the Canada Council Art Bank, the Museum of Contemporary Canadian Art, and the Manitoba Arts Council Art Bank. Uh, Bev is also an accomplished writer, and her artist's books are in collections at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Tate Modern, and in special collections in England and North America. And she's here tonight to talk a bit about her feminist art practice, also um, about the last few decades of feminist art in Winnipeg. Um, and we're gonna start by going all the way back to 1975. So, hi Bev, thanks for being here. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here, thank you very much. Great, um, so we're gonna go to 1975 and I'm just gonna set the scene, especially for younger people maybe who, um, <laughs> So it was, um, it was declared by the United Nations, it was declared International Women's Year. And I remember it as a kid feminist, I had, do you remember those Why Not posters, Beth? Do, for, oh my goodness. Yeah, I had a Why Not poster, I had Why Not buttons. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> you did your research. <laughs> and just to give some kind of, you know, historical context. So it wasn't so long ago, like in 1975, for example, married women had only been allowed to be jury members in 1964 or open a bank account in Canada without their husband's permission in 1964. Contraception, even disseminating information about contraception was only made officially legal in 1969. Um, the fight for Indigenous women to retain rights if they married non-Indigenous men had just started in 1970, wouldn't be successful until 1985. In 1975, there'd only been ever one black woman elected to parliament. In 1975, flight attendants could be fired if they married or reached, reached age 32 or weighed more than 140 pounds. Because <laughs> what tired businessman would want to be waited on by someone who was like 33 years old? So, so that was kind of what where things were in 1975. So tell us about these two art shows at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Yes, yeah, so that was International Women's Year and Sharon Zenith Korn, who's an artist here, organized it uh, in a flash with a bunch of other people, a committee for women's art. Uh, when she read that the WAG, the Winnipeg Art Gallery was proposing to do a show for International Women's Year of Women Nudes. And they got $10,000 from the Canada Council to put that show up. Now, uh, the bright stars out there can quickly Google what $10,000 in 1975 was like. It's a lot of money and they were going to do a show from the collection. And uh, so very little cost to them, but a lot of money coming in. And what they were going to do was ca call it Images of Women or something like this. I forgot. I want to thank Horizons Magazine, mm -hmm. Canada's one of Canada's remaining feminist magazines, for um, encouraging me to write this piece and making sure it was very 
well researched um, because they wanted to mark the 45th anniversary of this show. So what happened is Sharon hit the roof. She saw this advert for the show of women's naked women by right. men. Women as object, kind of. Yes. And uh, they were all works by men. So how, Sharon says, how is this going to help anything? It's not International Women's Year. The mandate was to foster women's cultures and women's growth and uh, women's power. Well, a show of naked you know, women, porn, a porny show wasn't going to do that. So a, a committee got together and they used every tactic. It, it, the records show they were very savvy activists and they created a manifesto, sent it all over the place. They engaged the government of the time and put on this in just a few months, which is really hard to do. Mm -hmm. They set up an international jury show. They found the jurors, two women, and it had convinced the WAG. They pressured the WAG from all angles to give them a gallery at the mm -hmm. same time as this nudie show was going up. Two weeks. So they had just a few months to raise buckets of money and get all these women coming in with their applications, including Judy Chicago from the States, mm -hmm. Alice Neal from the States, um, Lyndall Osborne from Canada, Sheila Butler from Canada. Lots of really fascinating work was in that show. Mm -hmm. The politics of the time, the feminist politics of the time were very different, I would say, than they are now. Yeah. But anyway, these women faced a lot of obstacles the one of the primary one was the director of the Winnipeg Arco. He thought that a show of women's work wouldn't be very good because women aren't very good. So he, <laughs> he said, I think you should, he wrote it. I have the copy from their archives. He said, uh, we should have a prominent community member on the jury. And what they were, he was meaning was the Lieutenant governor to decide what work gets in because he wrote something like, you know, women's work is a bit iffy. Yeah, he said it might not not qualify in terms of quality. Which is yes, <laughs> and oddly enough, you still see that. So it is a dated point of view, mm -hmm. but it's not an obsolete point of view. Mm -hmm. So they had trouble with Roger Selby. Now, um, uh, the, and he was suggesting a warning sign be because a lot of feminist work at that time was sexual. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he wanted a warning sign. Of course, the committee said, you know, go fly a kite to that one. Uh, the printer wouldn't print the catalog because he thought the male nude in there was uh, filthy. And you'll see a picture as, as we go on about mm -hmm. of some of these mm -hmm. examples. Uh, oh, one of the main organizations in Canada, what, who, that, was campaigning to get artist fees for artists when they exhibit their work, mm -hmm. uh, took exception to the women, the organizers, not paying artist fees. And the WAG, of course, said hands off. They weren't going to touch that. So there were protests and there was a lot of national media attention. Yeah. To and I mean, that, that's a tricky, because, I mean, Carfax... I mean, the idea of establishing art as labor and labor that needs to be yeah. paid is good for men and women, but yes. yeah, that they wouldn't budge for this one show. And, and as you pointed out that, that it did, it was an all male organization at the time. So that yeah. might've had something to do with them not budging. I'm just saying that it might've been. <laughs> so Sharon became very good, very quickly at uh, negotiating all this stuff. Mm -hmm. She hadn't administration as experience. She had four teenagers at home. That's uh, an administration and, experience, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She had Marion Yo. The late Marion Yo was her PR person. Mm -hmm. So Marion would do the organizing of the people, and Sharon organized the all the, the insurance, the shipping, everything. They yeah. also faced one problem from the um, guys who install these shows. They're called in the business the prep guys. Yeah. And they... This was a big show, lots of variety of work. And again, lots of reviewers were having trouble with the sexual content. And the prep guys did too. They thought, they wrote a memo that said, uh, we don't think this will be very uh, uh, safe. It'll be offensive to most people was the words they used. So that's so, 
even the prep guys. Okay, let's look at some of the work so we can see what what was making the prep guys. Good so idea. Nervous. Good idea. <laughs> even the prep guys. That's right. Even the prep guys. Yeah. Okay, so this is great. And you know, if you if you go to because the wag um it has uh um kind of looking back at its history has a little piece on this show and they they know oh, yes. that this poster is so popular that people steal it, which I think yes. is a huge compliment. And I would like yes. more details on that, like steal it from where exactly. <laughs> you know, so you're gonna show that poster now? <laughs> oh good. Okay. And and I just I love that poster. Uh, it's so seventies yes. for one thing, and it's a great yes. a great piece of work too. Yes. And um, it's not like there probably weren't breasts in the other show in the other gallery. Yeah. Yes. Know, but, yes. Um, but those are kind of academic nude breasts, which are considered yes. okay, I guess. While these kind of yes, these are in another category. Okay. Many of the works in that show, there were 76 works, I believe, in the show. It was a massive undertaking. And no wonder the prep guys were getting a little tired, uh, um, if that's what you want to call it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> what, a lot of the women's work was really turning on its head mm -hmm. uh, patriarchal issues of yeah. pornography, of erotica. Yeah. yeah. Um, of uh, power mm -hmm. and of identity. And so a lot of the women's work just slashed right through that. Right. So it made the show extremely popular with Winnipeggers. They just yeah. went in droves to see that yeah. show, not yeah. out of, not out of a snarky attitude. They wanted to see this work. So yeah. It was very successful. And the fact that it was only up for like, after all that work, it's only up for 20 days, you know, which is not yeah. long for a Terrible. show like that in, in a yeah. big gallery. I mean, people must have just rushed in to see it. Let's, yeah. let's look at the work by uh, Badana Zak, which, mm. uh, yeah. And and now she, she's a, I, this, I, I can imagine the prep guys might be a little nervous about this. Um, so she's a um, Toronto-based sculptor. Yes. She's studied under the minimalist Robert Morris kind of a strange oh. phrase studied under when you, when you think about it anyway oh and gosh kind of reacted against him you know clearly um but I, like it's great work kind of male genitalia as sort of vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, slightly comic but just obviously something that people were not um uh used to seeing uh maybe especially right. in a public gallery oh and yeah. I should Mind uh, viewers, if you want, um, if you want to ask a question at any time, please just enter it into the chat, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to see it. And you can do it throughout, or we'll we'll answer questions at the end. But okay, so yeah, um, yeah. And I just want to uh, read. Clara Hargate was writing about Zach's work. She said her oh. work, "A Flock of Great Canadian Geese," was it's forty five erect white phalluses adorned luxuriously. <laughs> feathers installed in a v formation uh, was clearly more hilarious than offensive nevertheless the work was declared obscene by some self-appointed arbiters of good taste and the then much more puritan canadian art establishment and for a while she enjoyed a great deal of publicity because of the alleged notoriety of her work well that work there was one piece that stayed in the show <clears throat> and then there were others that got banned. Oh, so really? Roger, Roger Selby banned it. And so what did Badana do? She went right to Zosky on CBC, Peter Zosky, oh, okay. got on his show, his famous uh, personality on CBC right until the 90s. Yes. She got on his show, and of course, he wasn't by any stretch a feminist at all. Uh, and so he asked her things like, well, are you sure this isn't tokenism or, you know, really your work might not be. She said, uh, when I spoke with her a month or two ago, he just didn't get it. But the point is, Badana wasn't going to take this calmly. And so, yes, it was banned, but it got national media ridicule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I can imagine that would make, people want to see it even more, like hearing about it on Morningside. Uh, <laughs> okay. And then, yes, Sheila Butler, and, uh, 
a really interesting woman and artist. She's a founding member of MAWA, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, and she also taught art history at DUW. So I, I actually was able to take courses from her. And um, yeah, and it, you know, it, it, she kind of large scale works, but really uh, a lot of drawing, you know, um, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of bodies in motion, uh, but often a kind of a sense of violence or threat or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah very interesting work yeah mm -hmm. she did a long-term swimmers series mm -hmm. and many of the works had the same title walking on water which is the one you'll see um so this was a recurring investigation for her mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 very neat artist yeah yeah and then uh, Sylvia Slay, and um, we're just going to look at a work. It's it, this actual work by uh, Slay wasn't in, but there was a work by her, mm -hmm. um, and she's just a really interesting. I think originally British, um, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure her work would have caused a bit of a stir as well because she she yeah. does tend to she's responding often to art history and taking something that if it was nude women, you wouldn't think twice about it because we've kind of been conditioned to that, to think of that as high art, but she would just bring in these very seventies guys, right. And, <laughs> uh, and position them in the same way. And suddenly it's kind of makes it's shocking for some reason, but you know, you look at the work and, um, uh, it's kind of celebratory, you know, of like 1970s nudity, you know, with the tan <laughs> lines and all the hair, right? Uh, yeah. You know, but but also, I think it's a bit of a joke. Like I, I you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how feminist art got this, you know, got this bad rap for being like humorless, where so much of it is very, very funny, right? Well, I find I think that humorless accusation accusation is a uh, fiction. Yeah. But it, if somebody throws an insult at you and just makes it up, then you have to deal with it mm -hmm. because they threw it at you. But yes, her work was a good is a good example of feminist turning on its ear mm -hmm. the uh, the patriarchal standards of the day. Mm -hmm. Now, her work was the one that caused the printer, the first printer to take offense. So it was a male nude and uh, he said it was filthy. He oh. said it was filthy. And so that he wouldn't print the catalog for that reason. Okay. Now they are in the show, there were women, naked women and other male news, but that particular one just got under his skin. <laughs> and so they quickly, you know, the last minute they had to find another printer. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I imagine the show really, I, I mean, it got a lot of national coverage, even international. Yes, it did. Coverage. Yes. And yeah. um, the, the uh, entry on uh, Sharon Zenith Korn in um, the Canadian encyclopedia says, um, uh, oh, that it was the first, um, the first national exhibit at a major culture, cultural institution um, to include depictions of women's experiences by women and to specifically use feminist criteria. So, I mean, that's a big, big groundbreaking event really here in our city. So that we don't know enough about until, until you. Yes. It. Yeah. And 45 years later, we're finding out, I was really honored to be able to publish this story. Partly yeah. as a tribute to Sharon, but as a tribute to all the other women that she worked with mm -hmm. to make this possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marion yeah. Yo, Suzanne Gillies. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. 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 And um, the Lieutenant Governor Pearl McGonagall. Really? That's it, Pearl. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I, and you know, I was I know she was very conservative, but she got on board for this. Which oh yeah, yeah. she just right. marched up the ledge steps and fixed things. <laughs> All right, <laughs> allies. Uh, yeah. And this is the work. Uh, this is a later work by Sharon Zenith Korn, but uh, shows some of her um, preoccupations and themes, mm -hmm. obsession, mm -hmm. I think. Yes, yeah. yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, so often kind of, again, using the body, um, mm -hmm. uh, female body, the male body um, in this kind of very uh, 
kind of, it has psychological ramifications. It has political ramifications. Yeah. Do you want to talk about this one? Well, you could make the case that her work especially shows the power that comes from uh, interpreting from your dreams, let's say, or from your intuition. So for many millennia, it was uh, not really approved for women to do anything but quilting or any, you know, it was good to do anything with a pattern, embroidery or sewing or something like that. But what Sharon was a part of was this drawing of your, from your unconscious, not connected to the sur women in surrealist movement uh, 50 years before that. Mm -hmm. but this is a much more mystical kind of work rooted in the body. So uh, it was it was quite neat for that. And that's why I wanted people to see this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's let's talk about your practice. And and first, how did you end up coming to Winnipeg? Because you were you're an Albert Alberta girl, um, but you ended up here. <laughs> I had a show at Plug In in 1984, um, and you're going to see one of the works. It was from a series called the Ghost Series about uh, going through someone's house. Well, everybody who's declaring in the pandemic will know what this is about. You go into the crawl space and all those mementos and you have to deal with that. So what I did was several drawings layered on top of each other, uh, this grieving process. So that was 1984. And at that time, Mao was just being organized. And oh. the first notice in the free press about it shows the director, Andrea Philp at that time, standing in my show. Oh, so okay. All right. I got so excited coming from Alberta where the culture is so different and, and it shows up in the art scene as well. Mm -hmm. And I just thought this is dead cool here. So I'm going to move. So in the 86, I moved here. It took okay. me a couple of years to work up to it. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> okay. So let's, let's talk about Mawa then. Um, so yeah, as you say, it started in 1984 at first under the auspices of plug-in and and as I, because I kind of remember that time, um, mm -hmm. one of the concerns was that that women were were attending at that time, were attending art school uh, at roughly 50-50 rates with men. Uh, okay. But once they graduated, they were not getting solo exhibitions, um, uh, cer you know, certainly not in large public galleries, but not even in artist-run centers. Um, and they weren't getting tenured uh, teaching jobs at anything like that rate, right? Um, and so, yeah, tell us about uh, a bit about Mawa, what it does, why it's important, you know, and your involvement. Well, it was founded in late 83 by Diane Whitehouse, and she was an ally of Sheila Butler, whose who mm -hmm. swimmer series you just saw work up. So Diane was on the board of Plug In, and she said, you know, I think we could do something. She was also teaching at the School of Art. I think we could do something for all these women who just fall off the cliff after they go to art school, which yeah. is exactly what I did. I graduated in 74 in Calgary mm -hmm. and nothing. So they invented a mentor program, and it's now 40-odd years where they would pair up a senior artist who was experienced in getting grants and getting shows with somebody who wanted to learn the ropes. Mm -hmm. um, and that way they actually, in my view, um, upgraded the whole art scene. Because when I moved here, I was on a jury in 86 and a man applied, which is in the days of, paper instead of online application. He applied in pencil without a budget. And I said, you know, this isn't, they said, oh, that's Dawn. That's just Dawn. That's that he got the money. <laughs> so these small incidents ended up radicalizing me. Um, so now what Mawa has done is educated and professionalized so many women. It's taught so many, encouraged so many women to take themselves seriously mm -hmm. as professionals mm -hmm. that uh, everybody now writes better grants. You see a much stronger quality. But when you're on a jury, you can usually tell without looking at the resume if they've been through the Mawa program because it's just so professional. 
Okay. So it's been very successful. Yeah. I'll just, I'll read a, um, from the Canadian art database, um, talking about Maui and the idea of mentorship. It says mentorship as a non-hierarchical peer-based system of learning is key to passing information, experience, and confidence down from one generation of women artists to another, strengthening both artists simultaneously, which uh, that's a lovely definition, I think. And, and does, cause I've mm-hmm. heard from people who've been mentors and mentees and, and, of course, the mentees taught, oh, I learned so much, but the mentors often say the same thing, which I think yes. is really wonderful. Yeah. That's the egalitarian thrill yeah. of women, a feminist culture, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I think so. Yeah. Okay. There's a so ripple I, effect. Yeah. A wide yeah. ripple effect of this, this work, because they have lectures and all kinds of other programs as well. It's internationally yeah. known. And workshops and yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, look a bit at your work, Bev. So um, I just wanted to start with an installation shot, um, and we'll look at some of the specific works in a minute. But I think we have to look at the installation shot just to get a sense of the scale that you're working on. Okay, okay. And that's kind of a feminist statement all by itself, you know, like taking up space. Because I'm just, you know, if you look at the history of uh, of women artists. It is certainly in the Western tradition, you know, they, they were often, you know, they were allowed in if they were like miniaturists yes. or, kind of painters, or, you know, yes. maybe Dutch flower painting, which is considered yes. small and suitable for yes. women. To do. Um, and then, you know, in like in the 1980s, after there was a lot of conceptualism and then in the 1980s painting came back, but it was often this, it, uh, it was often this big kind of macho. Remember when it was called big attack painting, big attack. Oh gosh, was it? Oh yeah, dear. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and, and it was kind of seen as sort of big and aggressive and macho, but you take up space in a really interesting way. And so why do you, why do you paint on such a big scale? A small person, <laughs> big work. <laughs> uh, it's thrilling to work that large. Yeah. Yeah. And when you show it, it's thrilling to see that you're taking up space. It's political, it's personal. Back to the feminist slogan back in the day, the political is personal, personal yeah. is political. It works both ways. Yeah. So if I could, I'd double the size. <laughs> uh, that would be dead cool to see this twice as big. Um, It's immersive. So that's Mm -hmm. why I do that. Uh, It has to work well close up. So there's a lot of detail that you won't see in this format. But if you get your nose right up to it, there's there's quite a bit of detail. So they take a year to do. And then you have to be able to enjoy the view from 15 or 20 feet away Mm -hmm. as well. And also walking in front of it back and forth because there's different glints as you... Right. Mm -hmm. Stroll from one end, they're 20 feet across. So it has to work on many mm, levels of perception, sensory levels. Yes. And I've heard it described as performative painting. Like, does, Mm -hmm. how does that, how do you define that? I got that from somebody else uh, who knows more than me. That word (laughs) is, it's not performative in the sense that. I want people to see me painting it, but the viewer has to do a bit of performing. They get to move around and enjoy some kind of stroll or meditation at different distances from it. So you're not, uh, the viewer just can't use their eyes. It's not just passive. It's it's, it's, no, that's how I'm using the word interaction. Okay. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay, well, let's look at uh, a couple pieces in the boudoir uh, series, which okay. uh, look at kind of unmade beds, I guess. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, so what, what is it about the boudoir space that, that fascinates you and makes you want to replicate it in some ways? And It's interesting now that I'm old as anything to see the line that you can draw between that work which was 1990 Mm -hmm. 1991 and now because back then you'll see in the paintings I was really fascinated with the ability to crawl into a cave 
So the grotto work that's now 20 feet across, you're walking into a cave. Now there's a lot of feminist theory about cavey bits and replicating vulva. And for that boudoir work, uh, there was a male reviewer in town who said, and he put it in print, he felt like he'd just been there and had sex. So I thought, well, that's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> There's the intellect involved there. But these little moments make, you know, put a little spring in feminist step when you, you see things like that. <laughs> so with the Boudreaux works, they're oil and canvas, oil glazes. So I wanted them to be like skin, to be tactile and luscious, like yeah. skin or velvet or silk or satin. And I wanted the visual effect to be tactile yeah and what it was talking about was how I felt inside my body at that time 30 years ago okay. that was my mission and and are you also referencing like textiles uh because th they are gendered as feminine you know that I, I, quilts you talk about women were expected yeah. to make quilts and is is it partly about women's labor making beds yes um, yeah labor, all that and so the woman isn't doing it Yes. So the yeah. woman in that whole series is never in the bed. She's doing things to the bed. So you're absolutely right. It was an intentional decision because once you put the women in the bed, then you're back into art history with all those odalisks and things like yeah. that. The women are in the bed. Oh, dear. Yeah. But I wanted the women to be actively determining their own situation. That's what I was up to there. Right. Yeah. And, and enjoying it the whole time. Yeah, and color, and, and I can see from your Zoom background that you like color, <laughs> like, and, and it's funny, you know, a lot of your boudoir paintings, they have a kind of sort of, they're in the purple plum magenta kind of range, and you often wear those colors, I've noticed. Yes, I do. Yeah. Th this, uh, th this is my dining room yes. uh, be behind me here. <clears throat> there, well, you know, everybody has colors that just mm -hmm. are... Yeah. So compelling. And for years when I had jobs, I had to have clothing that was more diverse. But now that uh, I don't have to do that, I just wear red and purple. So there was a passion for those colors back in the boudoir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're gendered colors for yeah. sure. So you have they to are. deal with yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And um, now... Your next really the series of like really big ones. Um, t tell us a bit about this, the microscopic remains. Uh, oh, so they're eight by 20 feet. And I was still, yeah, take a year to do it. I was still grieving my mother. And so I was trying to, and there was new science at that time that showed feminist science that showed that when people get a new organ implanted in them, liver or whatever, they report new memories, they report new sensations. The organ itself has a sentience. That's what the science was saying back then. It was so interesting. So I was thinking about that about viscera and how when you're grieving, that's the main site for your grief is your abdomen. Mm -hmm. And also when you're grieving, you're going through somebody's estate and all the memories. And uh, so I was thinking about how they can contain, like a transplanted organ, they can contain energy or me certainly memories. Yeah. So I was heading off into mystical land a little bit with those but the woolens and again, and you're working. I mean, it re it seems to reference viscera, but it's also referencing textiles again, which is is interesting. And I know what you mean, like because I inherited um, um, uh, textiles from my grandmother, and when I ironed them, the scent of her house would come out. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and and, and it that's is so very cool. evocative. And and yes. you talk about like this, uh, this sort of the matrilineal objects that get handed mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Um, you're also, um, you have very long titles, which I love, you know, um, cause you know, there are a lot of artists who just, well, I don't want to, I don't want to influence the viewer. I'm just going to, you know, it's an untitled or they give it a number and yours, your titles are very, um, they've got their own thing going on. Right. Um, so, um, like one is one, one of the works is called microscopic view of broken China. And then there's, uh, you've written on, on your website, it says chip teacups presage a peaceful midnight stroke and subsequent estate sale. Which, um, and that for this one, I think it says um, the warp and weft of viscera produce a humanoid tartan for unusual museum displays. So I like nothing that. more fun than playing with words. Yeah, really. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, Sometimes there's a notion that the visual and the verbal are like enemies, sworn enemies. And uh, I think you can do all sorts of things. Old fashioned. That's a modernist theory where. Yeah. It's the purity. Be, the purity. Isn't it, the there we go. Yeah. 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 yeah that, but the feminists really, their mission, Sheila Butler explained this to me, is to take all that um, fantasy about the lonely genius on the mountaintop you know, seeking their muse and creating this fabric. She said, that's just all garbage. So <laughs> that's not it, it, I know, it, it, yeah, like that. That, she's yeah. very frank. And so yes. that opened the doors for someone like me, who's a little bit odd to play yeah. and make it legitimate. Other people were out there doing similar things. Yeah. Okay. So what about, um, uh, the, the grotesque would you say grotesque or grotesque that that series oh the show uh it's a french word grotesque oh it's french okay it's right. an 18th century french word okay um for well we're using it for same thing for something that's gross grotesque right. so it's grotesque but it's also referencing grottos and yes so yeah. tell us about grottos what are grottos why did <laughs> you become fascinated by them how did that turn into art goodness okay so about well 2011 2012 i was in england looking up the culture of my grandmother who was yorkshire from yorkshire which is a very eccentric culture and i was trying to figure out you know is that where i get it from and tripped over a grotto in a, one of the castle estates there, decorated with seashells. And then in that gift shop, there was a whole book on it. So there's a whole subculture of, first of all, three or 400 years ago, people who made these things. And now there's a subculture of people who repair them and make new ones and people who restore the old ones, mostly women. And when you go in these pretend K, they're fake. So back in, they're completely fake. They're a folly. So if you were a rich guy around living around London 400 years ago, Alexander Pope's is the main, most famous one. You would just order your serfs to cut a lake for you. And what would they do with that soil? They'd make a hill and then they would dig out the hill into a cave. And then often the women would come in and don't forget they're wearing corsets doing this heavy work and they would do the plastering and the shell decorating. Okay. So they're big parts of state stately estates for mm -hmm. rich people. And they were, you'd stroll along and you'd see a pretend Grecian ruin. You'd stroll along, you'd see the Swan Lake, all pretend created and you stroll along, there'd be a grotto, and you'd stroll along, there'd be a Roman columbarium. And so it was all to get you to think and contemplate and maybe have a little tryst in one of these or write your poetry. Yeah, because they're very spooky to go in. There's usually a long, dark passage that opens up eventually, but you, you, all you can do at the beginning is quell your panic by just waiting you have to be very still because you're not sure the floor is reflecting it's moist you're not sure where to walk you're not sure what you're hearing uh and it's pitch dark so it's really exciting <laughs> to go in these things it's so it terrifying it's very uncanny and unsettling uh, yes and this weird 
collision of sort of nature and culture and yes. Yeah, fascinating. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, you've, you've picked up again with, you have the kind of elaborate titles uh, and, and you're picking up on something. It, it, it seems a little apocalyptic. Um, mm-hmm. Kinky maybe, I, you know, <laughs> uh, eccentric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so you're imagining sort of these elaborate underground communities or, or. They're refuges, they're sanctuaries. Sanctuaries. So, so it, but they're also, they also seem to reference the body as well, you know, like, oh well, gosh. I like all of your work maybe. Yes. Yes. There's one curator in the country who says, Bev, you just created another giant vulva. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on what your symbology is but what I create is there's a ballroom there's a spa so I'm thinking if we have to burrow if we have to seek refuge underground at least they should be entertaining there's yes, a conservatory yeah. I'm working on a place for trysting um anyway there's six so far yeah, there's a, a warren of seance parlors. Mm-hmm. And some of these grottos have held seances. There's photographs of seances because they're very spooky, energetic mm-hmm. places. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. And so are you, are you imagining there's been some kind of um, apocalyptic event that has driven us all underground? Is that... And it's actually based in science. There's studies of, um, I guess, the era of the dinosaurs as they were creating mammals uh, I don't know my my era but there were meteor hits and the dinosaurs that were small enough to burrow made it through a few of these and again you'll see it for example here uh, if there's a fire grass a brush fire or grass fire the animals that are underground through that can come up and and peek and see where the food might be so it might be, well, and I'm linking it to the London Blitz in 1941 when everybody went into Launched the subway. And yeah. right, the underground, yeah. And right. they, they got so happy down there because they had dart tournaments and grocery stores and nursings. They didn't want to come out. So in, in 1945, the English government panicked because they couldn't encourage these people by saying it's safe now, people say, uh, "No, I'm happy down there. I got my my farm and everything." So uh, that deep shelter mentality is the name for this, and so that's one of the things I think about in making this work. That's interesting, and um, wow, I wonder if that's going to have. Um, I, I mean, we're all kind of getting into a shelter mentality, I think, right now. So that's that's kind of interesting. Okay, um, and. Um, You've, you've also worked in artists' books um, at, at what you've call, uh, called evidence-based satire, which I think is a great phrase. Um, and and they're, they're sort of parodic, they're, they're funny, they're, and you're drawing on, on several forms that are often uh, identified with, with women and sort of women's ways of communicating. So the agony ant, you know, that was often on the, what they used to call the women's page of the newspaper. Yes, 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 yes. And, um, and sort of self-help for women. But of course you, um, you tend to turn that on its side. Yes. Um, and yeah. a commonplace book where women would just, uh, you know, uh, They'd put poems, they'd put uh, ideas, they'd put anything that occurred to them that they wanted to kind of preserve. And I just, I love the term commonplace book. Um, yeah. And then those sort of country diaries uh, where where a woman might uh, like do botanical drawings of whatever was yes. um, was blooming at the time in, in her immediate world, you know. Um, so yeah, um, tell us a bit about these, some of them. Anyway. <laughs> uh, there was a great quote in the Free Press article on this event uh, in Eva Wozni's article, it, and I hope I said it because it's very clever. <laughs> it, it says these books are uh, a result of living in a discriminatory society where the only real pleasure you have is to snipe. And so <laughs> that's what I'm doing. In these agony, agony is more of a British term. The Canadian term would be a Miss Lonely Hearts. Yes, poem. that's right. Yeah, 
And so people, more like uh, the character of Edward Scissorhands, they write in with, they've got a problem and what do I do? And then um, the agony aunt is more like Edith Sidwell, snarky and doesn't tolerate fools at all. And she says, well, just get a pin, you know, break that, that, um, what is it, inflatable mattress that he wants to take camping with his new girlfriend, just, you know, put Epsom salts in his food, give it to him gladly and just say, I'm happy to help. <laughs> so it's also about getting a wee bit of uh, innocent revenge that nobody can pin on you. <laughs> yes. So I do like writing that. Although I'll tell you, writing comedy is really hard. It's not easy because it has to be perfect. On the page. Yeah. No, yes, that's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, well, yes, I, I think a little, uh, a little malice, a little revenge. <laughs> yes. a little yes. yeah. yeah. Um, and, and no, no names mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Just protect yourself legally. Anybody out there who wants to try this. <laughs> um, and, uh, what about your, um, Anderson antidote tarot? Tell us oh, about. that was a commission recent. So the Anthropocene, oh, it was very recent. It's actually still up for a couple more days. Oh, let's on just my get the slide if we could. Um, so have you got something up? Oh, there we go. Yes. An image up? Okay. So andro- Anthropocene is the term used for this era. And yes. it, it, it means grammatically women and men have created this mess on the planet. Well, I have a feminist friend who says, and <laughs> this is, don't, we didn't have anything to do with this. It's the Androcene. It's men in power. It's businessmen who created this mess on our planet. So I was asked to create a few tarot cards to deal with the new age of Aquarius that we're in since, I guess, February. This is the dawn of the real age of Aquarius by the oh, like stars, if you believe. Yeah. Okay. So um, I created seven cards that have remedies for the andro scene. Um, so we need a strategist, we need a humorist, we need somebody who's impatient, somebody who can be a role model. And those hands, uh, the cave hands that we'll see in a minute, that's one of the um, remedies for the andro scene. Women have to work together. And that's very hard for women. We're just not used to it. And there's proscriptions against it. We could lose our husbands. We could lose our economy, uh, uh, you know. So working together is important. So that was one of the cards that I created. Yeah. And and again, it's it's the agony thing again, telling people what to do. (laughs) So you're bossy, basically. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. And and the cards also reference uh, art history, pieces uh, of art history, which I, I found yeah. interesting just because I think if you're looking at sort of what does a feminist art practice mean, uh, uh, it, it's not just, uh, you know, individual women making individual art. It's, it's you also have to look at systems and art history is one of those. Yeah. Systems, right. And yes. And yes. You brought this up that. Um, um that for a long time like it was thought that the roots of you know art uh, that, that of humans making marks to say we're mm-hmm. human here mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. way back in the paleolithic period mm-hmm. and and people just assumed oh it was men especially because it was often then there were paintings of hunting and mm. so it was right. assumed that the artists must be men and yeah recent research um, uh, looking at scientific data about hands has suggested that in fact a lot of the cave artists were women and this is across this is in Argentina but uh, in the cave artists cave art in in Europe as well mm-hmm. that it was women making these and well, that duh. No hands, <laughs> which I think is really nice yeah. Yeah. it's beautiful and that particular image of the cave in Argentina is so beautiful Mm-hmm. And when you look at it now without, if you throw out that early science that said, no, it had to be men, if you throw that out, you can see, of course, it's women. It's, and it's very beautiful that way. Mm-hmm. So women used to work together mm-hmm. until I understand the Greeks. And there were matriarchal cultures all over Europe and certainly in North America as well. Um, 
but then colonization happened from the Greeks and that continued by the Romans and they didn't want women to govern anymore. And so it's a long story, but I still have hope that we'll keep working towards that balance again. Yes, me too. Um, And, and, I guess uh, when we were talking about, you know, doing doing a, a talk and we're saying, you know, like, what is feminist art? It's a huge question. And you said sometimes it's easier to say what's not feminist yes. art. True. So let's just look yes. at, uh, and this is a recent piece. Yes. Um, yes. That ha- um, so this is um, Maggie Hambling. She's a, an English artist and this was a, a public uh, sculpture uh for mary wollstonecraft um you know uh this great feminist thinker who wrote the Vindic- a vindication of the rights of women in 1792 and um so yeah <laughs> so um, maybe we could get the next slide and just see the the larger uh, piece, but um, this just seems like a bizarre work that fails on like just a number of levels. Um, yes, yes. So tell us it, about this work. Everything's wrong with that piece. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so what's wrong with it is the head doesn't belong on that body. Mm-hmm. Uh, the neck is too long, and the head just doesn't isn't in the right scale for the body. Mm-hmm. The body is highly eroticized. And Mary Wollstonecraft, her fight was against that. And the pubic hair is a festival of inappropriate. <laughs> uh, it, you, you know, spread it open on your computer and you'll see. And it's on top of a big phallic plinth. So it, Mary Wollstonecraft wasn't given to running around naked in <laughs> 1792. She was yeah. fighting against the use of women's bodies. So this is tone deaf on so many levels, but was really neat was the second day this thing goes up and the next day feminists are putting little crocheted sweaters at the base of the statue and little (laughs) signs saying, we're sorry, you're cold. We're making something for you and little um, pots of soup. (laughs) So the English humor got engaged right away with this weird and lots of media attention that was not very kind to this artist. Mm -hmm. My own view is that this artist wasn't being herself. She was spouting the kind of rhetoric about what art should look like that I got in the early Mm -hmm. 70s. So she bought into that belief that you need the muse and naked women are important it's not just salacious and right so she wasn't a critical thinker you could say but that's one story but the best story is you know people making t-shirts for this mary wollstonecraft (laughs) yeah the grassroots response i think yes gives yes gives gives me hope oh it was so witty there's quite a few uh, photos of different responses all over the bouquets around the base of it. We're sorry that you look that they took your clothes off. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> it's really charming. So art can engage people in positive ways. That's the point of that, I think. Absolutely. Um, I see we've just got a couple questions up. So uh, okay. I'll ask you a couple. Um, okay. okay. The first one is you must have a huge studio. <laughs> so tell us about your studio. You're clearly not working in the dining room. Okay. Uh, yes, I do have a biggish studio. Um, uh, let's see, the paintings are now 18 feet, not 20 feet. So I think the width of my wall would be 25 feet, something like that, that I work with. And I can get back about 15 or 18 feet from it. So I'm very lucky. You need that when you're working this big. You have to be able to pace it the same as a viewer might to see how it looks from different angles. Right, right. Because you, you're up there working, but then you have to... Yeah. Right. How, yeah. how do you get it? Um, like, how do you get it out the door and do you have to take it downstairs ah. or? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, uh, it's paper. It's on paper. Okay. So I roll it around sono tubes, uh, okay. those shipping tubes, or they're also the tubes you see when people pour c- concrete pillars in the base yes. of a building. Okay. So I, I roll one around it. 16 inch wide sonotube and suspend that in the middle of an 18 inch sonotube. Okay. 
So they're easy to store and ship. Yeah. Th- that much, that big of a work on paper, is it, is it, does that, is it fragile? Is it like? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. It can rip very easily, not like canvas mm-hmm. that wouldn't. Yeah. Um, but it, it's to do with uh, the economy, like uh, my economy. I can't afford linen at that scale, I imagine, or oil paint, which would be too toxic at that scale anyway. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So those, that was her second question. Were, oh, I see. Paper. So we answered that. Okay. okay. Yes, um, just are there any paper. other questions, I guess? Anybody? <laughs> no. Not so far. Not yet. Oh, they'll come in later. Um, <laughs> people can write me through my website. You can go to my website. I'll leave that Andersen uh, Antidote Tarot up till the weekend. And the reason why I'm not leaving it up for longer is fear of patriarchal grant adjudicators. So. Yes. Yeah. So people, some jurors don't like feminism. I don't know why, but they don't. And so I don't want uh, that piece to be taken badly. So I'll put it up and bring it up and put it down, depending okay. on whether I'm applying for a grant and when. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why everybody isn't a feminist, but apparently there's some. There's a few holdouts. <laughs> there's a few holdouts. But yeah. um, there's a lot of uh, incredible uh, people younger than us who are fighting the good fight and, and yeah. fighting maybe different fights from what we fought back yeah. in the 80s, but yeah. um, very important ones. And um, yes, yeah. yes. So, um, OK, uh, I think we're coming up on the hour. So I just want to thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed this, Bev. And thanks for your insight. And uh for for your sniping <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> happy to oblige and i must express my profound honor to be part of your series it's it's just great, a great series and i'm thrilled to be here so oh, thank you for that thank you for coming and Keep thanks everyone for listening and uh and actually next month we're going to be um talking uh to uh some people from the mother's artist group at mawa actually uh to celebrate mother's day and mother artists so uh i hope i'll see you here next next month and thanks again bev thanks thank you everybody and good night good night